Welcome back to another episode of Movement is a Lifestyle. I'm your host, Ben Reuter. The purpose of Movement is a Lifestyle is we interview various movement professionals and people with interesting movement stories in the Pittsburgh area, trying to emphasize the South Hills area. Today's guest is someone I had to go back and look. I think we've known each other in passing for maybe 15 years, <laughs> yes. something like that. Our um, guest today is Sherry Locke. Sherry is the owner of Locke's Personal Fitness that is located on Fort Couch Road. She is an American College of Sports Medicine certified personal trainer, and she has a specialty certification from Titleist Performance Institute, Institute for working with golfers. Sherry, thanks for taking time to come and talk to Movement is a Lifestyle. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. One of the things that I really find interesting about talking to people who are in the movement field is finding out their story about how they got into this. So people can pull up your website and see and see the various things that you've done. But what was the impetus initially to say, I want to be in the movement field or the fitness field? Was this something that you knew you wanted to do when you were high school or did you fall into it accidentally or how did it happen? Well, it evolved. I was, um, I've been, I was dancing at the age of seven, which turned into student teaching and then I was a dance teacher. And when you're a dance teacher, you don't move around very much. So I started to uh, teach some exercise classes and then I thought, okay, maybe I should get certified. So I got certified through the American Council on Exercise as a Group X instructor. And then so that involved to teaching classes for the dance studio where I was. Then I taught for Mount Lebanon Recreation for a long time and some other uh, aerobic studio that's not in business anymore. And I taught for community college and um, Upper St. Clair Rec. And, I, and then I ended up also specializing in pregnancy fitness classes. So I was teaching pregnancy fitness classes and regular aerobic classes or body shaping classes or whatever they were calling them at the time. And I thought, okay, well, I'm, I really am getting into this. So I, I'm, I think I'm gonna study, you know, the personal trainer um, manual and see if I can just learn some more about anatomy and physiology and biomechanics and all that stuff because it was really interesting. So, but I don't want to be a personal trainer. I just want to learn more. So, um, I ended up. So I, I I ended up taking the test and I passed. Uh, so I passed the personal trainer exam and just around that time, my boss where I was working at PNC, he decided to take an early retirement and we always said when you go I go. So since he was retiring, I retired in my 20s. <laughs> and um, so then I just started doing a little bit of personal training like in home. And I was doing that for about seven years when I thought this is ridiculous, running from like Peters Township basically out to Fox Chapel in one day. So I thought, I think I'm gonna see if I can find a location. And so that's what I did and you know, that was back in 2001, and so here we are. And then I got the Titleist Performance Institute certification kind of over COVID as my COVID project, I guess. And I needed my continuing education credits also, but I was really impressed with, just with their programming. I think it comes into it from more of a physical therapy end of it because there are a lot of exercises and stretches that look like nothing. But then when you go to do it, they're surprisingly difficult. So, you know, so now I specialize in uh, the golf training as well as just regular personal training. And, you know, if I get a pregnant lady along the way, I know exactly what to do for her too. So. I know that uh, very often when people are very active and athletic, like you were in dancing, it falls into two realms when they finish their career, whether it's amateur or professional. I mean, I know where I went to graduate school, they had a very high level swimming program. And you didn't see any people who competed at the swimming at that high level, or you didn't see very many who continued to swim when they were done competing because they absolutely hated swimming. Yeah. Some of them found other sports like triathlon, and some of them became couch potatoes. When you finished your dancing and turned into the teaching, you said there wasn't a whole lot of movement uh, in the teaching aspect. Did you have something in the back of your mind that said, boy, I really like moving? Or was it something like, boy, I don't like the way my body feels and I liked better the way it felt when I was dancing? Both, but I also always, uh, whenever I was teaching a jazz class, 
Um, my favorite part of the class was the exercises at the beginning that warmed us up. So I just, I just always loved it. And teaching movement too, that's kind of, that's sort of different. And you know, you go from, if you can get, you know, 24 year olds to do the same thing, I figured this is probably a lot easier as they get older. So I figured, you know, it would be just a, an easy move you know, transition from dance to group exercise with adults. And it was, but the only thing with the adults is this hurts on that person, this hurts on that, and then they have something that doesn't work right. So now I'm modifying things for 30 people because I was the instructor that did that. I didn't just ignore what was going on in the back row, you know. I was, I'd pull them aside and say, okay, what's going on with that knee? Do we need to worry about it? So. Um, so in that respect, it was a little harder physically, you know, not like emotionally, <laughs> you know, trying to keep your cool with 20 kids running around. But, um, and, you know, it, and then eventually I liked the idea of working one-on-one -on -one because it kind of got hard to like control, not, just not, not control, but to just make sure everybody in a class was doing everything correctly so they wouldn't hurt themselves. So it's like my... Uh, philosophy is first do no harm and then from there you kind of build up but and I know a lot of people when they start out with fitness or movement or whatever we want to call it we're filming this in January so lots of New Year's resolutions a lot of people want to gravitate towards classes because number one they don't want somebody looking at them and picking them apart and saying you're doing this wrong or looking at them and saying you don't look right and the other thing that they often will want to go to the classes is because they're cheaper than mm -hmm. working with somebody one on one. But I often say the disadvantage of the classes when you're teaching classes is you have really two choices. You can either teach to the highest level of the people in the class, the people who are very fit, who don't have those movement problems. And then there are going to be a large number of people in that class who aren't going to get that benefit because they may not have that fitness level or they may have pre existing conditions. Or you can teach to those people who maybe aren't as skilled or as fit, and then the more fit people are going to say, well, Sherry's class isn't hard enough because we do easy things. And I'm interested, you said uh, your COVID project was the uh, golf certification. And what you found was a lot of the exercises just looked easy, and then they weren't so easy. Do you find with golfers that when they come in and you start to do some of these exercises that you learn through TPI and they kind of look at you and laugh as you demonstrate it and then they try it and there's kind of a wave of panic that goes across their face because they realize, oh, it's really hard. Yeah, a little bit. Um, we, we start with uh, the TPI golf screen, which takes them through about 18 different uh, fitness screens from their setup posture from it to their uh, cervical rotation down to their ankles. So it's a lot of flexibility and strength and just learning to kind of disassociate the top half of their body from the bottom half. And from that, TPI actually designs their exercise prescription and I follow that. But a lot of times they want to do uh, do more traditional exercises too. So during their, if they decide to sign up for personal training, we'll do like half the TPI and half traditional training, whatever they want. But I, for one, had no idea how flexible golfers had to be. And you know, when you look at the pros compared to like the amateurs, the rotation in their torso and in their shoulders is amazing. So. You know, I'm not used to doing rotational exercises. Everything else is more like more of a, you know, frontal or lateral kind of thing. And so just learning all these different exercises, you know, for rotation for every, every body part that rotates <laughs> is really hard. It's very different. And, um, and there's balance as an aspect of it too. So when Titleist was putting their uh, program together, they were comparing professional uh, golfers to amateurs and they noticed that the biggest difference between professionals and amateurs was balance and it might be because the one balance exercise that they have in there which I should say the screen that they have is you need to stand on one foot you lift your knee up as high as your hip catch your balance close your eyes 
and they want you to be able to do that for 15 seconds on each foot. And most of my golfers, no matter how good they are when they come in, they fall over in less than five seconds as soon as the eyes close. The only ones that ever pass it are the golf pros. So yeah, this, so we need to work on, you know, a lot of balance in there as well. I'm curious, are you a golfer yourself? I'm not a golfer, I'm a runner, but I've worked with a lot of athletes and uh, strippers and I've not done any of that myself, but I've been able to train them. <laughs> So, but I do, I would like to golf someday. It's just, it, it's, that takes up a day and I just don't have that time yet. So I'll drive golf balls and I've worked with a golf pro so that I understand the golf swing and the mechanics of it and the kinetic chain and all that kind of good stuff. But, um, so I tell people I can definitely help them hit it farther, but I can't help their aim. <laughs> That's a golf pro. <laughs> I'm curious, what was the impetus then to get the certification? I mean, obviously with COVID, there was a little bit more time, but there are probably you and I could go back and forth for the next 20 minutes naming different specialty certifications that you can get. Oh, yeah. Why, why the golf certification? This one was really interesting. Well, I have some clients that live up in Neville Wood and they were in the process of designing a fitness center up there. And uh, they had asked me my advice, you know, for some, some different things. And uh, the gentleman I spoke to asked me if I was TPI certified. And I said, no, what's that? And he told me about it. And he said, you probably should look into that. So I did as soon as I got home. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna be working with more golfers, I guess I better get this. And I thought, it's gonna be simple, here we go. I've been doing this forever, but it was really, it was very interesting. I learned a lot and it was a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be, so I had a lot of respect for it. But yeah, like you said, there are a lot of certifications out there for every little facet. You know, if you wanna exercise with a stroller, you get stroller fit <laughs> if you want certification. If you wanna, you know, uh, just, just about any specialty, they'll give you a certification for But that one, is very specific. It's rotational, which is not something personal trainers are used to working on. And I know. think one of the benefits of a certification like that is it is possible for somebody to get a personal training certification literally between now and when we finish filming in the next 20 minutes or so, or there are ones that are more difficult and require more knowledge like ACE, like ACSM, like the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Right. And by getting a, getting a golf certification on top of that, one of the things that personal trainers have to do, which is the dirty little secret, which we all know, but the general public might not know, you need to make money. And you want to have clients who value your expertise, and you want clients who have money where you tell them, this is the price for one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, and they don't go, yeah, that's more than I pay for my car payment or something like that. Right, so right. there is the advantage of having a, looking at certification saying, you know, golfers are people who have a tendency to be more middle class or upper middle class and it's more likely to say, hey, this is something that if it allows me to play golf and maybe not hurt the next day when I'm doing yard work, this is a valuable thing that I can do. Right, right. And with personal training though, I, you know, the majority of the people that I work with, whether they're golfers or, you know, just you know, the average person with their own personal goals is accountability. So like what you were saying with the classes, you know, how they're much more affordable and it's more affordable, you know, just to go and sign up for a gym, nothing makes you go. And you can just, I don't feel like it, I'm not gonna go. And so for that reason, I think we, we don't really get super duper busy in January, you know, with New Year's resolutions. I think those are the people that, say, okay, I'm gonna hit the gym every day or six days a week or five. They give themselves some really difficult um, expectations for that year. And then we start getting busy when they start falling off the wagon. So around the end of February and March when you know the wedding is still out there, the reunion is still out there, the cruise or wherever they're going that they wanna look better for, when they start falling off the wagon, that's when they'll come to us. and. Um, you know, we hold them accountable. And that appointment holds them accountable too, so. And I think you hit something that's vastly underrated in exercise. You talked about accountability. You can't convince somebody to work with you. You can't convince somebody to come and 
work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis or a one-on-two -on -two basis if you're doing a small group class. How do you articulate that to somebody? Because I've said before, one of the great things about social media is there's a lot of information out there. One of the bad things about social media is there's a lot of information and you can pull up all kinds of funky chicken exercises and personal training techniques, et cetera, which are questionable and they'll come in and say, I wanna do this. How do you explain to them that what <laughs> the benefits that they're going to see are not from coming to see you and you having, this is totally tongue in cheek, standing on a BOSU ball with a kettlebell in one hand and juggling with the other hand. How do you tell them that it's yes. like little small steps of consistency and explain that this is what it is? Right, well I tell them first of all, it's consistency that got them where they were. So it'll take some consistency to reverse that. Um, and uh, as far as like the Instagram, it's funny, I was just talking about that this morning with one of my golfers because I had a new exercise for him that I was telling him I saw on Instagram and then when they all kind of start sweating is when they're the guinea pig. But I said, here's the thing though, is when I see things on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, I know the good exercises from the crazy ones that people, you know, are gonna get hurt. So, you know, I look, I, I can tell which ones are safe and which ones aren't, which ones are gonna be effective, which ones aren't. Um, yes, yeah, so um, that's, that's the biggest thing I warn people about with the social media. But also, you have to explain to them if they have any kind of goals of like, just feeling better, if they've got like inflammation that just makes things hurt. You know, um, I have a good friend, Jason Metz, who he's, he worded it this way. He says, you can't out exercise a bad diet. And I always said the same thing, but I said it in a different way, but I like the way he said it better. But that's something that I've always, that I tell everybody now is you can't out exercise a bad diet. So, you know, if you're just trying to, you know, to lose weight or you're just trying to feel better overall, I mean, you feel so much better from the inside out and then before you know it you're like hey i dropped a couple of pounds and i feel a lot better too but it's like you know just they have to um they have to experience some changes and results in a positive way and then i think it's easier for them to be consistent but you know trying to get them to be consistent without having had any kind of uh, just success or progress with it. That's the hard thing, but that's where that accountability comes in because if they sign up for six or eight weeks, there you go, you know, let's give it that long. I think it's interesting, I never heard it put that way, but if somebody is very unfit or unactive, it took consistency to get there. And I like the way, the way you put that. Yeah. When you look back at your career and when you look back at what you've done and what you continue to do, are there certain types of clients that you say, you know, these are the types of clients that I work best with? Or are there certain types of clients where when you do a, a intake interview that sometimes you say, you know, maybe I'm not the best person for you. Somebody who's working for me might be better. Yes, usually we have people who, uh, who have their own interests. Like I love working with runners, you know, and golfers. And uh, we have some other trainers who have their specialties as well. And so if someone comes along and they have the goals in mind to increase their you know, abilities in a specific sport or something, I know my limits and I will give them to one of the other trainers. Um, I don't particularly like working with people who are in beast mode all of the time, so, but we have other trainers who do, so that's who they go to. Um, you know, I like working with the clients who, I love working with seniors. That's, I, I do love that. And then just, you know, people who are uh, just trying to not lose any strength as they go through life. They wanna get stronger or they do wanna look better. I'm, that, that I'm all comfortable with, but um, you know, the people that are in, like I said, beast mode, those are the ones that I give to the younger trainers. And it's, you know, and those people tend to be younger anyway. So they're more on the same wavelength and they can kinda, you know, just speak the same language, if you will, you know, where I, if I'm working with somebody that's really young, I feel like, you know, they might feel like I'm talking to them like I'm their mother or something, so, which I tend to probably do, but I'm always, like I said, first do no harm, so I, I'm on the safe side. Is that something you developed as you've gone through your career? Do you think maybe 15 years ago, you were more likely to say, yeah, I can take one or two beast mode clients? 
Yes, it, it just depends on if I have another trainer I can hand them to who I know would do a better job than I, I, I do. I mean, when I, when I first opened up my business, I had read this one book. I, I honestly don't think I would have had the courage to open up my own business had I not read um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> and um, I remember in there he said, hire people who are smarter than you. So... That really wasn't much of a problem back then. So uh, so I do. So I have lots of people that, you know, if they don't work for me, I know how to contact them and ask them the questions because you can't trust Google for everything. And when I first started, they didn't have Google and the Internet. I was having to talk to physical therapists about do's and don'ts for specific people. I was having to call pharmacists about the effects of maybe a client's drug on their exercise heart rate, you know, and... Um, so things like that, you know, I've had to actually work one-on-one -on -one with people, but like Google's a scary place for the fitness and, you know, industry, as you can, you know, you can consider the source, but people tend to go with whoever's the, the first, you know, on that list, and then they take that word as gospel. So I just try to be real careful with those people. And that's what I do, I like working with them. You mentioned you like working with runners. We've got in, four months or so, the Pittsburgh Marathon and the various races associated with it coming on. Do you see a few months beforehand an increase in the number of people contacting you asking about training for the marathon or doing resistance training, or is it more just consistently throughout the year, more by word of mouth? Um, I think it's just like people who, I do get clients that'll come to me that are looking f to just increase their strength and flexibility as it pertains to their running. And that I'm really happy to help them with, whether it be temporary or long term. I've got clients who are runners that I've been working with for years and years and years, just because they like, they like to train all year for, for everything. And um, so, you know, we've worked even through some injuries and, you know, uh, I've learned through their rehab what are good exercises for that specific injury and, you know, we'll keep those in their program or whatever. Um, but yeah, for the most part though, I, it, people come to me because they just want to get into a program where they can stay on track and when that run comes or when whatever it is they want to do, a lot of people are into pickleball now, you know, <laughs> and so, you know, you, they just want to stay in shape so they can continue to do their favorite, you know, their favorite sport or athletic or leisure activity. And we actually had an opportunity a couple episodes ago to talk to Larry Joya, who does uh, side out pickleball here in the Pittsburgh area. Okay. All right. Yeah, I've got a lot of pickleball people that they'll leave the studio after their workout and say, I'm going to play pickleball now, and they just love it. You've been in the business 20 plus years now. Looking back, is there anything that you do now that you wish you'd known when you started in 2001, 2002? Looking back, you go, God, how could I not have known that? Or what's one or two things that you've learned that are really valuable that you provide to new, new uh, personal trainers that you work with? Um, I don't know. I think it's just, you know, there's so much that I've learned on the job, you know, and so after you come through your certification and you know you you've got that kind of knowledge in your head but it's different when a client comes through the door with a cast they didn't tell you about you know or a crutch or their their family member that was in from out of town and you have to think faster on your feet um, you know I, I can do that much better now I don't know if there's anything that could have trained me for that before because it's the unexpected and um, so that's just something that comes with, you know, ex or just with experience and years and decades of working out with all different people. So um, I don't know if I would have done anything different because I think everything that I did is what got me, you know, to where I am now. You've mentioned a couple times your mantra or one of your ethos is do no harm. Is that something that was taught to you? Is that from experience? Or is that something just with your career as a dancer, you look back and say, wow, I w was made to do some things that maybe weren't the best for me? Um, I don't know. I think first do no harm was something that I would just repeatedly read as I was you know, trying to get certified for my different certifications. And I just 
always remembered that so I feel like instead of starting someone in beast mode and then backing them off it's like you start here and then you go up this way because I'd hate to see anyone backslide you know after they've made some progress and sometimes they do have some pretty crazy goals and they want to do things their way which you kind of got to know where that line is but if they're a new client you don't know where that line is so you know there's times where you're working with someone and you keep saying all right how does that feel and they say it feels great and I say do you want to do another set or do you want to start here stop here and they'll want to keep going and halfway through the workout they don't feel so good and they got to sit down and they're apologizing they don't feel good I mean not enough to make them physically sick but just you know we have to stop so um, you know just that kind of stuff I know one of the reasons people spend so much time if they're personal trainers on social media is they want to look good and have fancy pictures and fancy videos that go viral one of the questions people often have when they talk to small business owners is how do you get clients do you do word of mouth do you do advertising what's been most successful for you um, mostly it's word of mouth well for the longest time it was mostly word of mouth um, then you know, really to survive as a business you have to be on social media somehow and I'm terrible at that and I don't really have time to keep posting pictures and I'm gonna try to I keep saying I'm gonna get somebody to do that for me but yeah so that right now that is probably the I get the most from my website and you know people searching and uh, you know, but we've had banners and flyers and business cards and stuff like that. And I'm lucky enough, like where my business is right now, the vestibule I decorated it is all basically like golf related. So that's kind of snagging a lot of the golfers in the building who are going upstairs. We have a um, there's a financial advisor above me. There's an accountant above me and a, uh, an oral surgeon. So all kinds of people are coming in there. Lots of golfers. And so you know I think a lot of the, I think that helps too and I have a big banner that's attached to the uh, railing along the park along the parking lot and that's grabbing attention too. So you've been in the business a fair number of years if you think back for when you started even before you started when you were doing the jazzercise classes and the group classes do you have friends back then when you started your business they said you know Sherry you're crazy nobody's gonna do fitness for a living in the Pittsburgh area or was everybody like, yeah, this is Pittsburgh's ready for this? Because, you know, like it or not, Pittsburgh is not what you think of as being a super active community like, for example, San Diego. Right. Um, I didn't really have anybody saying anything, um, like, discouraging me as far as uh, exercise in the Pittsburgh area. It was more like, a, are you crazy? Do you really want to risk, you know, leaving your job for something that's unknown? And I thought, well, I'm definitely not going back to that job because I worked at a bank and I'm not a banker and no one wants me about round numbers. Everyone knows that's my, my worst uh, my worst thing is like numbers. But um, so I was like, I have to make it work. Otherwise, I have to go back to having like a real job. And that wasn't going to happen. So and the more people like made me feel like I wasn't going to be able to make it, the more I was like, well, now, now I just have to. So here we are, 20, almost 30 years later. We've been talking to Sherry Locke of Locke Personal Fitness. Remember, movement is a lifestyle, not just an activity, because movement is part of what makes your life complete.